Please be advised, this episode does have content that some may find distressing. As always, listener discretion is advised and it is not suitable for anyone under the age of 13. Hello and welcome to episode 51 of It's Murder Up North. Please join me in supporting my latest podcast of the week, called Beware the Quiet Ones, a wonderful new podcast in which the hosts have worked hard to create in-depth coverage of their cases. Here is a sneak peek. Silence makes some people uncomfortable, anxious. You can't shake the feeling that you don't know what the other person is thinking, what they're capable of. Others use that same silence to their advantage. They sit back and observe, unnoticed, waiting. I'm Meg. And I'm Laurie. Join us for our new weekly podcast, Beware the Quiet Ones, where we will explore all things spooky, true crime, dark histories, and haunted places all in our home state of Pennsylvania. Now, let's head to the episode. The 1st of March started as a typical Wednesday in the town of Berry. People started their morning routines, shops began to open, Commuters set off for work, and children made their way to school. The pupils of St Gabriel's Roman Catholic School began to pour through the gates, wearing their dark blue blazers, light blue shirts, and blue and yellow ties. They moved like a hive of bees into the various classrooms as the bell sounded for morning registration. Joe Geeling settled into his chair, small in build, standing at just four foot seven. He had a slender frame with pale skin, sandy brown hair and bright blue eyes. His smile was infectious and he proved popular with his fellow students. At 11 years old, he was in his first year of high school and he was proving to be a good student, eager to learn with a positive attitude and a bright future. By all accounts, he was liked by both pupils and teachers. John made his way through the school day eating lunch with his friends, attending all his lessons, just a normal school day, except for the fire alarm sounding in the afternoon, which caused the school to be evacuated. This, however, proved to be a false alarm, and lessons quickly resumed. At the end of the day, Joe was seen leaving school alone. Normally, he'd walk the 15-minute journey with a friend, but on that Wednesday, his friend wasn't in school, so the petite boy set out alone. He should have been home by half four, but he didn't arrive. An hour passed and his mum became concerned, and when Joe hadn't made it home by half past five, the police were called. Joe had always been home by 5pm, as that was the time he had to be at the hospital for treatment for cystic fibrosis, which is described by the NHS as an inherited condition that causes sticky mucus to build up in the lungs and digestive system. This causes lung infections and problems digesting food. The 11-year-old had been diagnosed with this condition at just six weeks old, and despite having to attend numerous hospital appointments and receiving treatment to help manage the symptoms, John never let it get in the way of him living his life. But he also knew the importance of his hospital appointments. So when he hadn't arrived home, his parents feared that maybe Joe had fallen ill on his way home. The police response was swift and a full-scale search was begun, which involved not only the police but the fire brigade and mountain rescue teams. They were joined by volunteers, including teachers from the school, in the hopes of finding Joe as quickly as possible. A description of Joe was issued, in which it was stated he was a slim boy, about four foot seven in height, with short dark blonde hair and a pale complexion. He was last seen wearing his school uniform of a blue blazer dark grey trousers, black timberland boots and a blue overcoat. Early reports from fellow students at Joe's school suggested that the 11-year-old had been seen walking along Manchester Road in the direction of his home. This was a major route, which at the time he left school would have been very busy with other students and multiple vehicles collecting their children from school. Joe's route home would have likely seen him heading over a footbridge which crossed a railway line. He would then have headed south on Manchester Road, passing primarily residential properties. It is likely he then would have headed onto Wellington Road, 
a quieter side street, which had a park on the left-hand side, and houses on the right. Police had to consider the possibility that Joe had cut through the park, as there is an entrance on Manchester Road and another one shortly before the street where he lived. As such, this area was thoroughly searched. The Bolton Search and Rescue Team reported on the search efforts, recalling that they were asked to join the efforts at approximately 20 to 10 that night, amid concerns that Joe was a vulnerable child with a medical condition who was wearing only his school uniform. This became an increasing concern as the temperature dropped to minus 6 degrees Celsius, or 21 degrees Fahrenheit, as darkness descended. Through the night, parties continued to look for Joe. Canoes were deployed into the partially frozen River Irwell. Police dogs scoured the bushes, and parks, alleys and gardens were systematically checked, and a helicopter hovered overhead. As the sun rose on the 2nd of March, news crews began to appear, as reports of the missing child began to filter out of the town, and the hunt continued, those involved hopeful that Joe would be found. While the search was underway, Joe's grandmother, Margaret Lynch, told the press, quote, He is a level-headed, happy little lad, and it's extremely out of character for him to go missing. We're all very worried. When the school day began at quarter to eight, officers were deployed to begin asking students and staff questions, in order to ascertain where Joe may be. They quickly learned that Joe was a content child who had no reason to run away from home and was very popular at school. He was also a responsible boy who wouldn't go anywhere without letting someone know, and as far as his school friends knew, Joe was just heading straight home after school. One lead, however, would refocus the search efforts. A number of pupils advised that they had seen Joe on Ainsworth Road. With this information, a team was deployed to search the area. Ainsworth Road headed east out of the town flanked on both sides by terraced houses until, on the left-hand side, the houses made way for a large area known as Whitehead Park, with a children's play area, open fields, and a wooded area, with a small gully running through it. It was in this damp ditch that her body was discovered by a police dog at 11am, covered in a blanket of leaves. Police advised that the body had been concealed by a number of objects. However, they were not prepared to name the deceased until a formal identification was made, and they would not divulge whether the individual appeared to be injured. Shortly after this discovery, Joe's father, Tom, arrived at the park, anxious for information regarding his son's whereabouts. He was witnessed being gently led away from the area by officers, as forensic teams set about investigating the scene. By midday, news began to emerge that an arrest had been made and police activity was reported taking place at a home which lay in close proximity to the park. As more information began to be released, a wave of disbelief took over the town, when it was revealed that the individual who had been arrested was just 14 years old. People had already suspected that the body found was that of 11-year-old Joe Geeling, and floral tributes began to be placed at the gates in the park, one bearing the message, quote, Rest in peace. What kind of society do we live in? As Joe's mum, Gwen, and dad, Tom, along with his siblings, were comforted by priests from their church, police were granted more time to question the individual they held in custody. For two days, Joe's remains were kept in the park, while forensics combed the scene for evidence. The body was moved on the Friday, but still no formal identification had been made and forensic teams continued to search the semi-detached house, its gardens and an alleyway that ran behind the home. On the Saturday, a post-mortem was performed, and the formal identification was made, confirming people's worst fears, that the body was that of Joe Geeling. With the news that the remains were those of the 11-year-old boy, the head teacher of St Gabriel's School, Eddie Robinson, made the following statement to the press. Naturally, our school community is shocked by the death of Joe Geeling, one of our Year 7 pupils, and our thoughts and prayers are very much with his family at this difficult time. Joe was a lovely, well-mannered boy, who is going to be greatly missed by all his teachers, friends and fellow pupils here at St Gabriel's. We are mindful of the emotional trauma that this has placed on our pupils and staff, 
and we are very grateful for the support we are receiving from our priests, the wider church community and the local authority. Obviously, circumstances surrounding Joe's death have shaken our school community. We would welcome the time and space to deal with this over the coming days and weeks, and it would be greatly appreciated if you would extend this courtesy to Joe's family. Rumours and speculation filtered through the community. Naturally, people wanted answers. Were the children safe? Why was Joe a friend in a park which was in the opposite direction to his home? And who was the 14-year-old that police held in custody? Superintendent Peter Schofield, who was leading the investigation, advised that the arrest was a direct result of the body being discovered and that they were not looking into anyone else in connection with the death. The school's head teacher, Eddie Robinson, also confirmed, quote, We've been told a 14-year-old pupil was arrested on suspicion of murder. We don't wish to make any further comment. While the police continued the investigation into the murder of Joe, a sombre mood took the streets of Berry, as on the 31st of March, the 11-year-old was laid to rest. Hundreds of mourners attended this service, and the streets were lined by people wishing to pay their respects to the little boy. Prior to the funeral, his parents reflected on who Joe was and what he meant to them, and his siblings, James, Kelly, Danielle and Sean. Mr Geeling stated, There is such a massive hole in our lives. Where the house was full with Joe chatting away, asking questions, it is now deafeningly quiet. Joe was an 11-year-old going on 50. As a toddler, he was very tactile and always seeking attention. If your eyes strayed away from him, he would grab your face and make you look at him. He was a chatterbox. He would never stop talking and was always asking questions. If he wasn't happy with a short answer, he would keep plugging away until he got a full explanation. Joe loved school, football and biking. He could talk to anyone and made a lasting impression wherever he went. Everyone remembers his infectious smile. He also had a wicked sense of humour. His parents requested that instead of floral tributes, that donations be made to the Berry and District Cystic Fibrosis Trust and Booth Hall Children's Hospital, where Joe had been receiving treatment and support since he was born. Leading the service, Father Cannon stated, quote, When a child dies, we are inclined to say, What a pity! He died before he was able to blossom fully. When we speak like that, we speak of promise rather than achievement, and that is unfair to Joe. The most important thing about Joe is not what he might have achieved, but the fact that he was, and the fact that he achieved much in his short life, and is still achieving much. Joe was like the apple blossom that has fallen to the ground in a storm, a short life but a life that through his character and personality, his zest for and love for life, have perfumed the very air that we breathe. He brought colour to his family's life and many other lives. On the 10th of April, the 14-year-old appeared at Berry Magistrates Court. However, due to his age, the press were not allowed to report on any details on the individual who was accused of the murder of Joe Geeling. During this hearing, the suspect entered a guilty plea but it would only be after the trial, which was set for October 2006, that the full details of the crime would be known. The court would learn that the 14-year-old boy was Michael Hamer, who attended the same school as Jaw. Unlike Jaw, he was popular and excelled academically. Michael was a lonely teenager, who was the victim of bullies. He struggled with his studies and was found to have both behavioural and learning difficulties. However, he did not demonstrate any signs of violence, and he came from a respectable, middle-class family. Michael Hamer was born in 1991, while his mother Julie was pregnant. His father, who was a police officer, left her, and Julie was forced to raise Michael alone, having very little contact with her son's father. The barrister defending Michael, David Steer QC, told the court that when the defendant was younger, he had overheard his father state, that he had, quote, no feelings for the boy, a remark that the barrister would argue left Michael feeling rejected and isolated, unloved, denigrated and humiliated, which the defence argued led to a negative impact on his psychological development. Due to his mother being a single parent, 
she would often be at work until half past six in the evening, which meant that Michael would come home from school to an empty house, struggling to form relationships with his fellow classmates, who would bully and tease him. Michael became isolated, which was only deepened by the hours he would spend alone in his bedroom. In 2004, Julie had become so concerned about her son and had contacted social services for assistance. During sessions with a social worker, Michael expressed his feelings of loneliness, which had been made worse by arguments with his mother and a growing desire to have more contact with his father. Michael also advised that he was being bullied at school, and when this issue was raised with St Gabriel's, they swiftly took action, including the expulsion of a number of pupils. Police would uncover that the teenager retreated into a fantasy world, in which he was a teacher. He had created school timetables and registers with the names of the pupils who he attended St Gabriel's with. This role-playing was later explained to the BBC by Professor Kerry Cooper, who stated, If somebody pretends to be a teacher when they get home, it sounds like they are creating a fantasy world. It's not necessarily a good way of coping with being bullied, but it enables them to feel that they have some kind of control for a short period of time, even when they really don't. This desire for control and his loneliness led Michael to try and form friendships with younger boys, both for companionship and a desire to have some control over them, hoping that his age would cause them to look upon him as a leader. As 2006 began, Julie started to notice her son displaying some unsettling behaviour. Michael seemed to have lost his appetite, and she started finding food left hidden about the house. She became more alarmed when her son began causing damage to the property by stabbing the walls with knives. The defence portrayed Michael as a victim of circumstances beyond his control, advising the court that he was, quote, an isolated and psychologically flawed teenager who had no previous convictions or history of violence, but his intellect was low to average and he was immature for his age. Alistair Webster QC for the prosecution, however, argued that the murder was a premeditated plot that had been planned weeks before it was carried out, stating that the murderer targeted his victim, led him away by deception, carried out the killing with significant brutality, and set about covering up his crime in what appears to be a surly, calculating way. As the trial progressed, the details of the murder plot began to come to light. It was revealed that approximately three weeks prior to the deed, Hamer had started to concoct his plan, and on Wednesday the 1st of March 2006, he made his way to school as normal. Arriving on time, there was no signs of the dark plot he had in mind. Joe Geeling was dropped off at school by his mum, having spent the night in Booth Hall Children's Hospital, where he had been receiving treatment for his cystic fibrosis. The 11-year-old walked into school with a smile on his face and a spring in his step. It would be at dinner time that Michael and Joe's paths would cross. At midday, Michael approached Joe while he was having lunch with his friends and handed him a letter, which advised Joe that Michael had been appointed as a student mentor, a programme that was run by the school in which older pupils would be assigned to assist younger students in their studies. The note advised that Joe would be required to go to the older boy's home address to collect some books which formed part of the mentorship programme. The note also explained that his mother had been informed of this and that she would collect Joe from Michael's house. The note had been signed by the deputy head teacher Linda Foley, giving Joe little reason to suspect that this letter was not legitimate. However, police would later find that Michael had written this letter they discovered multiple copies of it, one in Joe's pocket and more drafts in Michael's bedroom, which showed the extent of his premeditation. The letter came to the attention of a teacher while Joe was in his history lesson. She noticed that Joe was in a small group of friends who were whispering to each other and were distracted from their studies. Heading over to the pupils, the teacher inquired what was causing the commotion. Reluctantly, Joe produced the letter but refused to let the teacher read it, stating that the contents were confidential. After some encouragement, Joe handed the letter over to his teacher, who became suspicious of its authenticity 
due to the fact it had been written in red ink, and neither the handwriting nor the signature was consistent with that of the deputy head, Mrs. Foley. The teacher advised Joe that he should speak to Mrs. Foley directly regarding the note, and he should ignore its instructions to go to Michael Hamer's house, with the teacher urging the eleven-year-old to head straight home as normal when he finished school. This teacher was so concerned regarding the letter that she would later discuss it with another member of staff and ask them for advice. During afternoon break, Joe is witnessed standing outside the deputy head's office, as instructed by his history teacher, and shortly after this, the history teacher and her colleague, whom she had gone to for advice, observed Joe, who was accompanied by Michael. The teacher asked Joe if he had been to see Mrs. Foley, as instructed, and the eleven-year-old paused, glanced at Michael, and then stated that he had spoken to the deputy head. Looking at the older boy with Joe, the history teacher asked if he was the Michael mentioned in the letter, to which Joe confirmed that he was. But before the teacher was able to investigate further, the conversation was interrupted by the fire alarm, which resulted in the school being evacuated. It will later emerge that despite Joe claiming he had been to see Mrs. Foley that afternoon, the deputy head stated that this was false and that she had not had any interaction with the pupil that day, and the fire alarm that prompted the evacuation proved to be false, and had been activated by a pupil in another part of the school. Tragically, this incident would prevent further scrutiny of the note. At the end of the day, Joel leaves school. He is later accompanied by a group of friends, and they walk together down a footpath that led over a railway bridge, and then proceeded to walk down Manchester Road towards Joel's house. However, his friends reported that Joe told them that he needed to go to the shop, and he departed from the group, who presumed he was heading to a sweep shop near his home. More eyewitness statements revealed that Joe had instead headed in the opposite direction, up Manchester Road, where he was seen passing the blockbuster store, and shortly after this, another onlooker observed the 11-year-old walking a couple of paces behind an older boy, who they identified as Michael Hamer. This last sighting is haunting, not only because Joe is unknowingly following his killer, but they are seen passing by the park in which the eleven-year-old's body would later be found. At the edge of the park, Joe and Michael turned down a side street, with the park on their right-hand side. They then proceeded to cross the road and took a left, followed by another right, onto the street where Michael lived. His house was a typical red brick semi-detached, with large bay windows to the front, looking out onto a small garden. A white front door sat recessed into a curved porch, beyond which the stairs led up to the first floor, up which Michael led Joe. The pair entered the 14-year-old's bedroom, in which Joe would be brutally murdered. When he was arrested, Michael quickly confessed to the police and gave them an account of what happened once Joe had entered the bedroom. He advised that he had led Joe into the room, and proceeded to strike the eleven-year-old about the head with a frying pan. Michael confessed that he struck him with so much force that the handle from the pan snapped. The teenager recalled that he must have hit Joe approximately ten times before the handle broke. He then alleged that Joe was still alive, but barely conscious and he left the stricken boy on the bedroom floor while he went downstairs to the kitchen, where he picked up three knives. He then returned to the bedroom and continued his attack on Joe. During the trial, details of the injuries Joe sustained came to light. The 11-year-old suffered a fracture to his left eye socket. He had also been stabbed 16 times with two different knives, primarily around the head, face, neck and upper body. The prosecutor highlighted the brutality of the attack, stating that one of the stab wounds was 8 centimetres deep. Another punctured Joe's windpipe in two places, cut a major artery, and reached Joe's spinal column. Prosecutor Alistair Webster QC continued, quote, It is unclear whether this represented one or two thrusts. But again, the nature of the wound suggested that the knife had been moved around whilst inside the flesh. The post-mortem suggested that this stab wound would have required severe force. Joe was stabbed three times in the back of the neck and three times in his head, 
There was also a cut on his right thumb, where Joe tried to defend himself. After Joe died, Hamer stabbed him once more in the right buttock. There has been no satisfactory explanation advanced by Michael Hamer for this wound inflicted upon Joe's dead body. End quote. The descriptions of the events that occurred on that fateful day, detailing how Michael then proceeded to drag the deceased down the stairs, through the living room and kitchen, out through the back door where he placed the body in a bin, which he had positioned ready for the disposal. At half past four, Hamer was seen pushing a wheelie bin along the short stretch of his street, to the alleyway that ran down the side of his house, past some garages, and then joined another alleyway which ran along the rear of his home. He then proceeds to the park, where he pushes the bin along a footpath, passing between a children's play park and the tennis courts. The path then led around the bowling green, where a witness reports seeing a, quote, spotty youth, about five foot eight inches tall, struggling to drag a bin along behind him. Another witness noticed an individual who hid behind a bin and appeared to be on the phone. The route then led along the edge of a large field, passing by a number of rows of terraced houses, until the path came to woodland, into which Michael dragged the bin into an overgrown area, where he disposed of the body, concealing it beneath some discarded soft cushions and mattress, rocks and twigs. The body was so well concealed that during the search, it was initially missed by some firefighters, and it was only when a police dog was brought through the area that they were alerted to the presence of the body. The extensive concealment also resulted in the delay of the removal of Joe's body from the area. Having disposed of Joe's remains, Michael was seen by numerous people walking with the bin. This time, however, none of them reported seeing him struggling to move the bin as he returned back through the park. Although it was reported, he was talking on his phone. It emerged that the teenager was speaking to his mother on the phone who had called him when he had failed to answer the house phone. Due to her work at a call centre, the conversations between the mother and son were recorded, and this audio was played during the trial. It was noted that throughout the conversations, Michael's voice seemed calm, and did not suggest anything out of the ordinary had occurred. During the first call, Julia is heard asking her son why he hadn't answered the house phone, to which he responded, because it didn't seem to be working. Mrs. Hamer proceeded to ask, did the house phone not ring at all then? Which was answered with a simple no. Hearing noises in the background, Julie inquired where Michael was. He told his mum that he had just nipped out and was nearly home, to which his mum repeats the question. Michael told his mum he was about five minutes away from home. Sensing her son was being evasive in his answers, Julie insisted he told her where he had been. Michael told her he had just been to the park. His mum advised she would call him back in about half an hour, and when she did, the pair spoke, this time on the house phone, which now seemed to be working again. Unbeknownst to Julie, her son had committed a brutal murder, and while she was working the final couple of hours of her shift, Michael was working to cover up the crime. He attempted to clean up the bloodstains on his bedroom floor, and then proceeded to sit at his desk and do his homework. When Julie arrived home, Michael had finished his schoolwork and was bathed ready for bed. His mum did not see anything out of the ordinary, except for a dark stain on the carpet, which he explained had been caused by a red biro that had leaked. The following day, Michael arrived at school, reportedly unfazed by what he had done. A detective remarked, quote, He appeared to treat the next morning like any other, arriving at school on time, dropped off by his mother, he displayed little or no emotion. Throughout the process, he appeared normal, apparently unconcerned. However, during the morning, a number of pupils told teachers that they last saw Joe with Michael, and given this information combined with the information regarding the suspicious letter the previous day, the 13-year-old was taken from his religious education lesson. Once in the head teacher's office, he was questioned about what he knew about Joe's disappearance. His inconsistent responses caused concern, and the police were notified. Police arrested Michael, and by quarter to eleven that night, after speaking with his solicitor, Michael confessed to murdering Joe. During his interviews, 
the teenager told officers that he, quote, wanted Joe to be stood by the blue bars of the school gates, waiting for something to happen, so he would feel lonely, isolated, the same way Michael felt in his life. He wanted Joe to feel what a victim of bullying felt. He told the officers that Joe had come to his house that day because the 11-year-old needed a phone charger, and Michael had offered to let him borrow his. However, this explanation was questioned by investigators, stating that Joe could simply have gone home to charge his phone. He also noted that when the boy's phone was recovered, it still held a sufficient charge, which cast further doubt on Michael's story. With regards to his relationship with Joe, the court learned that prior to the incident, the two boys barely had any contact with each other. It was also pointed out that Joe was not one of the individuals who had been involved in bullying Michael, and so it led to the question as to why the 14-year-old had targeted Joe. Michael had told the police that, quote, the victim could have been anybody, it just happened to be Joe. However, it was suggested that he resented Joe and had become jealous of the younger boy, who was popular with both students and teachers. Joe was also excelling in his studies while Michael struggled academically. As well as being jealous of the younger boy, police believed that the 5'8 Michael targeted the slender 4'7 Joe because of his cystic fibrosis, which Michael perceived as being a weakness and made the boy an easy target for his plot. During the trial, however, another motive became clear. It was claimed that once Michael had gotten Joe alone in his bedroom, the older boy made a sexual advance on the 11-year-old. According to Michael, Joe rejected him, called him gay, and threatened to tell people about what had happened. The killer claimed that this reaction, and the threat, triggered him to attack Joe. There was strong evidence of premeditation in terms of planning that went into luring Joe back to Michael's home, a plan that had taken at least three weeks to concoct, and suggested that the defendant had always intended to cause the victim harm. Mr. Steers QC stated for the defence that, quote, We are really dealing here with an adolescent sexual approach which went horribly wrong. The rest followed, no doubt to do with this defendant's background and state of mind. Realising what he had done, he panicked and decided to conceal Joe's body in the way he did. The defence continued by claiming that while Michael was in his angered state, raining down his brutal assault, the teenager, quote, could see the faces of his tormenting bullies. Having highlighted Michael's previous issues with regards to bullying and difficulty forming relationships, Mr. Steers QC stated, This previous background to the commission of the offence leads both psychologists to conclude he was a young man suffering from an abnormality of mind in the form of an adjustment disorder. With regards to Michael's varied accounts, the defence told the court, we submit, he simply did not feel able to admit that his motive was a sexual one. He found it easier to give these other accounts. Michael had only admitted the real reason for the murder in the last few days. He made a sexual advance towards Joe, who responded to him as gay, and threatened to tell others about what he'd tried to do. He then tragically responded in the way he did. I've been asked specifically by Michael and his mother to express their sorrow and deep regret for what happened in this case. Alistair Webster QC for the prosecution painted a picture of a premeditated murder, targeting a child who had been diagnosed with cystic fibrosis at the age of six weeks old, although Joe's parents took measures to ensure their son had a normal life. The condition affected Joe's development, meaning he was small and slender for his age. On the day he disappeared, Joe was due to go to hospital that evening, which is what prompted his parents to contact the police. But tragically, as the prosecutor told the court, quote, By the time the police received the call by his anxious mother, he was already dead, killed by the defendant, Michael Hamer. Although, Michael Hamer has never given what the crime would say is a true account of the evidence of the death of Joe Geeling. Despite his tender years, the murderer targeted his victim, led him away by deception, carried out the killing with significant brutality and set about covering up his crimes in what appears to be a surly, calculating way. 
the prosecution did agree that Michael was a lonely and isolated individual who had been the victim of bullying. However, it was also pointed out that Michael and Joe had very little contact prior to the murder and that Michael appeared to have been using the school's mentorship system to his advantage in order to gain Joe's trust and that this was further compounded by the letter that was alleged to have been written by the deputy head, which for a child in their first year at high school, who had always been taught to respect authority figures, would probably not have been questioned. Mr Webster went on to state that one of the many distressing features of this all-too-distressing case is because Michael Hamer has never given a consistent and credible account of why he did what he did. Joe's parents still don't know why their son was taken from them. And like the rest of us, they can only seek to tease the truth from the evidence. It was revealed that whilst awaiting trial, Michael was assessed by a number of psychiatrists who concluded that he suffered from an adjustment disorder, but they found no signs of any other psychological issues. During one of his sessions, Michael alleged that he had not written the letters until the day before the murder. However, he would later tell another psychiatrist of a letter he had written which described sexual activities involving Joe, and that this note was written almost a month prior. The prosecutor argued that, quote, it is clear that Joe was lured back to Michael's house, where the murder took place. In interview, Michael suggested that Joe had gone back to the house because he wanted to use a charger for his phone so he could contact his mother. That explanation does not stand up to examination, however. It would have been infinitely more sensible for Joe simply to go home, and when his mobile phone was recovered from Michael's house, it had enough charge to be operated. The Crown says that Joe was enticed to go to Michael Hamer's house upon some pretext. Alistair Webster continued by describing the manner in which Joe died, and again pointed out the inconsistencies in Michael's story. Advising that during one version, the teenager had alleged that Joe had hold of a photo which he refused to give back to Michael, and this had caused him to attack Joe. At the conclusion of the trial, it was clear that Michael was an individual who had suffered from rejection and bullying throughout his life, causing him to retreat into a fantasy world, where he took on the role of a teacher, who had control over those who were younger than him. This need for control, and an in-depth feeling of constant rejection and isolation, was exacerbated by his sexual desires towards other boys, which he was struggling to come to terms with. With regards to the crime itself, he had shown a level of planning, taking advantage of the school's mentoring system, as well as playing on Joe's respect and trust in authority figures. Michael was also seemingly unaffected by the brutal attack, including the calmness with which he spoke to his mother, to continuing his routine as normal, finishing his homework, bathing, and ultimately sleeping in the very room in which he had taken Joe's life. The following day this continued with him going to school as though nothing had happened. Michael had however confessed to the murder and he had admitted his guilt prior to the trial, resulting in him being sentenced to a minimum term of 12 years before he would be eligible for parole. In his closing statements, Mr Justice Richard McComb stated, quote, Michael Hamer harboured significant feelings of distress from the absence of a relationship with your father and suffered a significant degree of bullying at school. I am now told that within the last few days that you have admitted to Mr Steers, your defence counsel, and to your solicitor, that you made a sexual advance to Joe, who responded by referring to you as gay, and threatening to tell others of what you had done. Joe, as you accept, had done absolutely nothing to encourage any such advance. The rejection of the advance was the immediate triggering event of what you did to Joe. You took away Joe's life and damaged the lives of all who loved him. Following the judgment, the prosecution appealed the sentence on the ground that they believed it was too lenient, given the nature of the crime, and this resulted in his minimum term being increased by three years. In 2016, Michael applied for early parole, having spent nearly ten years behind bars. However, this request was denied due to recent evaluations that stated he was still considered a high-risk offender. The judge overseeing the hearing stated that Hamer is, quote, 
clearly highly committed to achieving a better understanding of himself. It is apparent, reading the reports, that he accepts responsibility. He confessed to it on arrest and pleaded guilty. However, I have not been able to detect from the reports the extent of his expressed remorse. All the reports I have read, whilst being uniformly positive about his progress so far, record that there is still further work to be done. Mrs Justice May denied the request for parole, meaning that Michael would not be able to apply again until the end of his 15-year term, which would be this year in March 2021. Naturally, questions are asked regarding what drove the 14-year-old boy to take the life of a fellow student. Michael is an extremely rare example of a victim of bullying who turns his feelings of rejection and isolation into violence against another individual. According to Professor Carrie Cooper, who led a study into the effects of bullying, stating that victims are more likely to self-harm or attempt suicide, quote, The person who has been bullied has been so dramatically bullied, so violently bullied, kept it so much to themselves and buried it, that they have lost any sense of reality. If it turns into violence against themselves or other people, there is usually a trigger mechanism. Those cases involved a lot of suppressed anger, which has to come out in some form or another, but to turn the violence gratuitously against somebody else, so violently that they take somebody else's life, it's very, very rare. Michael's actions devastated the community of Berry, the students and staff at the school, and left his own mother heartbroken. But he also ended the life of a boy who lived life at a hundred miles an hour, bringing positivity wherever he went. His father Tom made the following impact statement in court to express the depth of their grief. Quote, Our son meant everything to us. We spent many happy years grooming him into the smart, witty, loving young man he had started to become. In spite of being born with cystic fibrosis and enduring more than his fair share of hospital visits, he had a no self-pity attitude. He understood that these were the cards God had dealt him, and together we made the best of what we had. He was indeed brave and kind-hearted. Since the day our son never returned home from school, Things went from bad to worse to unbearable. My wife and I privately weep all the time. We weep about what we could, would and should be doing with Joe now. Sometimes our son James, seven, is inconsolable. We fear for his future and about when Hamer will be released. Will we be safe? We just pray to God that as the years pass, the pain may ease and the happy memories return. Thank you for joining me for episode 51 of It's Murder Up North. Join me next week for episode 52. So in the meantime, keep an eye on those shadows. 